I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Association with Project Group, they definitely withheld information. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Do you believe that our government is in possession of UAPs? Absolutely. Right, everybody, welcome back to Total Disclosure across all platforms where we explore the mysteries of the unknown from sightings to conspiracy theories. We dive deep into the ex unexplained occurrences in our skies and on the ground. If you're passionate about exploring the unknown and you're intrigued by the possibility of extraterrestrial life, then you're in the right place. Let's get this intro just over with, right? I've never been more excited for a show in my life. Um, one of the top people I've always wanted to talk to, uh, today I get the chance. And uh, yeah, a little bit of nervous jitters, but that's okay. Today we're talking to Robert Salas. Uh, Robert has an absolutely stellar stellar career and uh, is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy. He served seven years on active duty, worked as a weapons controller, flew target uh, drones, commanded intercontinental ballistic missiles, otherwise known as Minutemen. Um, and uh, in his time, he experienced one of the most notorious UFO incidents at uh, any nuclear air force base uh with that being said let's welcome the man the myth the legend robert salas um robert thank you again uh for being here today and i am so excited i'm a little i, I haven't been nervous for a show in a while i'm, I'm a little nervous <laughs> a little nerves are fine uh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah hey tyler it's great to be with you uh i love your excitement uh about this subject uh and um, I'm, of course, I'm eager to answer any questions you may have about my incident and uh, other related topics uh, that may come up. Uh, happy yeah. to be here. Yeah. Well, well, I think one of the first things that we should get out of the way is who is Robert Salas? Now, why Robert Salas before joining the military um you know what made you choose that career path um what motivated you um and and why well to be honest uh i was looking for ways to get into college and i uh, my parents didn't have the resources to send me to uh to college uh, so i uh applied uh to my congressman to be considered for an appointment to one of the military academies. And, uh, and of course the air force Academy was the, uh, my first choice. Um, my, uh, some of my, uh, aunt, uh, my uncles were in world war two fought in world war two. One was in, uh, the Pacific, the other in, uh, in Europe. And, uh, so, there was a motivation there to uh, enter the service and get my college degree at the same time. So, 
when going through that process, uh, you know, did you, did you ever see yourself, uh, 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 becoming the, the person with the hand on the key for the nuclear arsenal? No, honestly, uh, that was not my, uh, one of my goals. Um, uh, so, uh, that just happened, uh, um, due to circumstances and, uh, assignments that, uh, were offered at the time. Uh, so no, that was not an objective. <laughs> so how I would assume now, this is just me assuming you would have to be of not only the top caliber, but among the top caliber of the top caliber, um, as far as mentality, um, constraint, um, uh, uh, mental awareness, situational awareness. Um, what, what were the, uh, um, uh, prerequisites for a role that you would eventually accept as a launch commander? Uh, well, I know we were, uh, evaluated before selected for this kind of duty, but I don't know the details. I, I was not made aware of how they made that evaluation. Um, uh, but um, I, so I really can't answer that question in detail. Uh, I, I simply don't know what criteria they use to select us for this sort of duty. So <laughs> that's, that's kind of not, I don't know if it's troubling. I don't know. I don't think it would be troubling, <laughs> but is it safe to say though that, you would need to be now, I mean, you would need to have scored a certain proficient, you know, a certain score, uh, have a certain background um, and, you know, be of sound mind to be in a position where, you, you know, um, you're essentially safeguarding um, the world at that point. I mean, I mean the U S is, is arguably, you know, the, the biggest superpower um, and, you know, we, dictate uh, essentially uh what is you know the, the global atmosphere so um to be in that position i just I, I would assume that there would be more of a of a, a selection process um so you're well, saying uh, as i said i think there was a process to evaluate those of us that went into uh uh this kind of work and had this kind of responsibility, but I simply don't know those details. Certainly, uh, I would think we'd have to be reliable and uh, uh, committed to uh, our jobs. And uh, uh, but uh, you know, I'm struggling here because I simply don't know the criteria. That's that okay. It's okay. Well, you know what. Let, let's just breathe, you know, it doesn't really even matter to the context. Um, but all right. So you go through, right. You get the job. Um, can you describe your role and your responsibilities um, at Maelstrom Air Force Base and subsequently on the night of March 14th, 1967? Uh, okay. I'll, I'll correct you on that date. It was March 24th. Oh, that, that must have been a typo on my part. My bad. Uh, but um, so we were broken up into two man crews uh, and uh, we were sent out to what is called launch control facilities where we had the ability to uh, monitor and, of course, launch missiles if given the order correctly. Uh, and that was our duty uh, to maintain, uh, make sure the missiles were uh, ready to launch and then to launch uh, given the proper orders. Um, we would uh, go out to what's called a, a, a launch control facility, but then there was a, something called a launch control center, which was 60 feet underground. We would go down in an elevator and we would be uh, locked 
we would relieve the crew on duty and then we're locked in for 24 hours until we were relieved the next day. Oof. And this was, uh, we had a little cot down there. So we took breaks from time to time, take a rest break. Um, on the evening of March 24th, 1967, I was in charge of the facility because my commander, um, whose name is uh, Fred Mywald. Uh, he was later Colonel Mywald, and he is now deceased. Uh, but on that evening, uh, he was taking a rest break, and uh, I was on duty in charge of the facility. Uh, so the first thing that happened uh, was I get a call from my topside security guard. We had about six guards upstairs uh and they were used to uh, of course monitor our particular facility but they would also go out to the launch facilities where the missiles were actually located the missiles were located approximately a mile or two uh away uh, in a kind of a circle around this central point called the launch control center right uh, so the main guard calls, uh, sometime in the evening hours. Uh, I can't tell you the exact time. I don't recall other than that. It was dark outside. Of course, we had no window into outside. We were 60 feet underground. We had no cameras up there. Um, at any rate, a reports that he's seeing strange lights in the sky flying very fast, uh, uh, stopping on a dime, reversing course, uh, making 90 degree turns, things you've heard from other witnesses, uh, but that's what he told me uh, specifically. Uh, and he said, uh, he wanted to emphasize, these are not airplanes, sir. Uh, I've never seen any airplane do what these lights are doing. Uh, so, and there was no engine noise, um, but it was these these things were flying over our facility, um, and he just wanted to report it. I didn't quite know what to think. Um, I may have mentioned, you mean like UFOs? Because uh, I, I think I did make that comment because uh, we had had reports in the local Great Falls Tribune newspaper. Uh, Great Falls is where Malmstrom Air Force Base is located. Um, about people reporting uh, objects in the sky. So uh, I was just joking, really. And uh, his response was, well, all I can say is they're not aircraft. And uh, I said, well, OK, well, thank you for your report. And we terminated the call at that point. I didn't know what what else to do with it. I certainly wasn't going to report lights in the sky back to the base. So, well, so when, what, I mean, what was your initial reaction when the, the flight security controller, you know, reported those unusual lights in the sky? Did you think this was, I mean, in your head, you had to have questioned, you know, um, could this be adverse, adversarial? Uh, yeah, I thought it was a strange call. You know, their job was to secure the facility and and maintain security. And uh, uh, so I think he was trying to alert me to something that could happen uh, because of these lights nearby. And uh, but we didn't have enough information at that point. Now, he calls back within minutes, maybe five, 10 minutes later, and uh, starts screaming into the phone. Uh, I couldn't make sense of what he was saying, uh, but he was obviously frightened. Uh, I, I, when I finally got him to calm down, he said that he's got all the guards uh, pointed, pointing their weapons at this object. It's a, a glowing reddish-orange pulse.